Perhaps there's the despair of like, what's what's the point if everything, what's the point of composing a symphony if I can just tell prime intellect, like compose me a symphony. We're seeing that with uh, chat GPT and open AI and mid journey yeah. and stable diffusion, like people are getting depressed. Hello, friends, and welcome back to the Creativity, Spirituality, and Making a Buck podcast with David Nickturn on the Be Here Now Network. My name is Michael Cammers, your host and monologist. And on behalf of all of us at Be Here Now and Dharma Moon, we sincerely hope that this podcast finds you as well as can be, and we are grateful that you are joining us. Here at CSM, our guide, David Nickturn, discusses how to lead an integrated life involving spiritual practice, creative expression, and right livelihood with guests who embody and manifest these principles in their own life. And in this episode, we are very excited to have artist and comedian Ramin Nazer joining us. Now, Ramin shared a very brief biography with us, so as you are listening to this intro, I encourage you to head over to RameenNazer.com or his Instagram profile and take in the incredible digital art that Ramin makes. I'm personally a big fan. His works are kind of meme-like in that they have a short text on them couched in very compelling psychedelic imagery. Each one is like its own artistic pith instruction. Seeing his work, if you are unfamiliar, will be the best intro for this podcast. So here goes Ramin's bio. Ramin Nazer is an artist based in Los Angeles, California. He's the author of After You Die, Infinite Elephants, and Cafe Paintings for Future People. Ramin has been a featured guest on The Late Late Show on CBS and has appeared on Comedy Central's animated series, Tales from the Trip. You can listen to Ramin interview a variety of different artists, musicians, and comedians on his own podcast, Rainbow Brain Skull. Ramin is currently promoting the Rainbow Brain Skull Oracle Deck, which is a beautiful art object on its own and is designed to help you see the bigger picture, make better decisions, and become more in tune with the flow of life. Now available for purchase at his website, RameenNazer.com. You can also download it as an app. We encourage everyone to follow at RameenNazer on Instagram for new comics every day, and check out his Patreon while you're at it. Okay, friends, it would not be an opening monologue of the CSM podcast if we did not mention some of the upcoming program at Dharma Moon. So we are very excited to announce that we are offering our very first in-person retreat, Wind Horse, raising power and energy to meet the challenge of living. Join David and the Dharma Moon community for a special five-day retreat Wednesday, May 1st through Sunday, May 5th, 2024 at Tibet House's Menla Retreat Center in Phoenicia, New York. We will come together in person to learn the transformative wind horse practices to connect with our unconditional confidence, natural vitality, and each other. Space is limited and this retreat is expected to reach capacity, so be sure to reserve your spot as soon as possible. We always have lots of exciting stuff in the works and these podcasts are evergreen. So whenever you are listening, we encourage you to head over to dharmamoon.com to check out our programming around mindfulness and Buddhist studies. Okay, friends, that's it for the intro. And now it is our pleasure to share with you episode number 51 of the Creativity, Spirituality and Making a Buck podcast with Ramin Nazer. Okay, so welcome back, everybody, to the Creativity, Spirituality, and Making a Buck podcast, uh, where we try to talk about those kind of things together with some people who are themselves uh, exploring any of those or any two together, all three together. Um, I can give things. you the first two. Okay. Maybe not the <laughs> second one either. <laughs> well, that's sometimes I say, here's the three things, pick two, because uh, that has a history. But I want to introduce our guest to you all today, which is uh, Ramin Nazer. And I hope I'm saying it exactly. Hi, right. thanks for having me. Hey, everyone. <laughs> am I am I saying the name correctly? Oh, yeah, you nailed it. Okay, Ramin. So um, Ramin is a new friend. We've just been chatting for a bit before the podcast. And he's, he's what we would call a, a multi-dimensional person in terms of the, what his activity in the world is. He's been a comedian. Uh, he's at, probably widely known as an artist of kind of a unique uh, style of, of, of 
presenting, which I'm going to want to ask him more about, and um, and a podcaster yourself, right? You you you're actively yep. engaged in, in in communication that that way. So first of all, uh, welcome and thank you for joining our podcast. Thank you. It's an honor. I've been looking forward to it. I don't know how long we've been trying to put this together, but uh, you know, it's one of those ones where you reschedule every. Uh, every month, like, no, I'm, I'm gone. No, I'm gone. No, I'm <laughs> not waking up today. No, I'm not waking up today. That's probably more me, but, uh, no, looking forward to this one. And, uh, okay. yeah. And, uh, then I saw that you were on a podcast with my friend Raghu Marcus from Love Serve Remember Foundation. Love the goo. Who doesn't love the goo? <laughs> love the goo. <laughs> I mean, some people don't, I guess on Reddit, but Reddit people don't like, uh, Anything. Isn't that the gig on Reddit is what you don't like? Yeah, if you show up there, you got to at least hate half of everything just to be right. there. Yeah. So uh, because our podcast is on that um, platform, um, and you may or may not know, but I'm actively engaging with those folks regularly because I play guitar and produce records for Krishnadas. Yep. So so I, I'm with them on retreats in Boone and in Maui and so forth. So... Um, the satsang. Satsang, yeah. Raghu, Who, Sharon Salzberg, Krishna Das, you, the spirit of Ram Das, spirit of Neem Karoli Baba. Yeah, that's interesting too. Um, and of course, some of our mutual friends, that's how I met them is through that. I, I met Duncan Trussell, who's a mutual friend. Pete uh, Holmes. Pete Holmes, who's a mutual friend, who also used to live in that neck of the woods that, that you're in, still in. Steven Tyler. Um, have I think he just by stopped by the... Yeah, yeah, he has stopped by the retreat. Um, yeah, there's uh, all kinds of um, interesting collection of folks. So who do you like to hang out with these days? Are you hanging out who? with comedians, artists, all kinds of people? Um, I've been bad about hanging out these last few months. I've become, uh, unintentionally insular. I would say like a good mix of half artists, comedians, musicians too. musicians I've been hanging out with. It's, it's a weird thing in, uh, Los Angeles. It's, it's isolating in a way. And you're also connected to everybody and you have lots of, not everybody. I mean, maybe I'm fortunate, but you have I have many friends of different interests and it's difficult to coordinate getting together regularly because you get swept away with this and that and you you make plans and then you can't go to the plans or you're not feeling well that way and it's easier to bail on a plan than to just get up, get dressed, go find parking, drive across town right. like uh and that, that's all my fault. It's not anyone else's fault. You know, me. driving used to be easy in L.A. In, in, back <laughs> in the day, it was you just you kind of flowed through the, the town. It was very pleasant. Um, but it's much more challenging, right, to get from A to B there. Yeah. And just the way that there's so much to do in your own house, I feel like also uh, let's take it back to pre-internet days. You would probably get bored in your house like, no, we should go hang out. Let's go mm. make stuff happen because I've just got this magazine and my own thoughts. So let's go. And then the three channels on TV. But now there's endless everything and you've got your own projects and you've got your own emails to to catch up on. And then when you're weighing it, it's like, should I go hang out or should I catch up on work so that I don't fall behind so I can... Da -da 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 -da. And um, But that's my goal of this year is of if I if I commit to a thing, then that's then it's happening. And I don't mean that I flake on people if I say I'm going to pick them up at the airport. I mean that... Um, you know, if it's, oh, we, sh we should hang out next mm -hmm. week. That, mm -hmm. that to me counts as like, I'm going to do it. I'm not going to let it float away into, because yeah. I find that, uh, I heard this somewhere, but relationships rarely end. Like, it's rarely like, I'm never talking to you again. This is it. It's rarely, it's more often that they just kind of disappear over the horizon because you rescheduled for a month, two months, a year. And that's they how they on the vine. Yeah, exactly. They're just not getting enough juice coming through. It's and you need it. Yeah. You need uh, you need to connect with other people, even if you think that that lunch will be boring or getting coffee with someone will be boring. It's it's so important to to just actually do that every now and then. And yeah. the online is no replacement for it. It's mm. 
it's a very cheap facsimile mm. of it. It kind of fools your conscious brain into thinking that you did a social thing, but the rest of your your being was not nourished. Well, and I imagine that your artwork keeps you in house for part, you know, significant part of the time, right? You can't really that's not really a social activity when you're doing your artwork, right? No, I mean it could be. There's live painting and you can get together with people, but Honestly, the the visual artwork, it is um it's bad in a way because I can do it alone, I can do it from bed, and I can listen to something else while I'm doing it. Like I can listen to a podcast or oh, yeah? uh, music or anything wow. while I'm doing that stuff. Whereas if you're composing music or you're editing a film, you can't listen to a podcast while you're making music. It's too um, it, it's competing for that focus, but this way I don't have to really focus. I can, I can color while there's music and I'm trying to, and that's why it takes the place of other stuff such as music or, or podcast uh -huh. editing. Well, so I ended up doing that more. And how, you know, I don't know if this is exactly right, but, um, the midnight gospel, I know you're aware Your of episode it. one, right? No, I was in episode four. I believe. Oh, I remember you as episode well, one. Maybe maybe six. maybe, maybe Doctor Drew was episode. Maybe you're the first episode I put on, but I don't okay. know. I, for some reason, I remember like, oh yeah, you were the first episode of that. But so I, I know you must know Pendleton Ward, who's the artist in, in in that series, right? I know of him. I've never met him though. It's we've just never crossed paths because. Uh -huh, um, is, is there anything in your way of looking at it that has any kind of similarity with what at least at least the it has some flavor that has that's reminiscent a little bit of the artwork in that series. Oh yeah, we we get compared to each other pretty you do frequently. Okay. Yeah, and um, it, when that show first came out, some people thought I was involved in it, okay, and I, I to say no, I was not involved. Okay. I was okay. I knew Duncan, I knew about the show before it was uh, even in the production stages. I knew he was working on something with right. Pendleton with old podcast episodes and then i forgot about it for two years and then when it came out i was like this is so cool and it came out at the perfect time it is so cool and believe it or not <clears throat> or you know maybe it's not that strange my little appearance as a cartoon character in that series has had major ripple effect in terms of people coming and studying buddhism nice <laughs> and dharma and our, our we have at dharma moon we have a teacher training program and you know, quite a few uh, Duncan uh, recirculating energy through his through his community and ours. Um, yeah, he's he's brought. I mean, him and um, maybe Pete Holmes too. I don't know who has the the bigger effect on the metrics, but I just imagine like so many people find you, Ram Dass, that whole "Be Here Now" satsang right. uh, ness thanks to him and. Then you can trace that also to how many people wouldn't know about Duncan if it wasn't for Joe Rogan podcast. How many people wouldn't know about any of that if it wasn't for podcasts, if it was just uh, the four late night talk shows. So the thing is just uh, what you need to hear. It's so much um, easier to find. Well, and do you, are you a techie at all? Are you interested in tech? Yeah, yeah, I am. I would say I'm a techie. And that word has, because tech has accelerated faster than anything, you can have a lot of knowledge and still know nothing. Like, for example, I'm not, I'm not great with blockchain, NFTs, crypto, that's not really my interest. Um, I'm an I'm an okay, like, 2D game programmer and web developer and that kind of stuff. And I yeah. follow singularity and futurology. Yeah. Uh, well, well today, uh, the day of our conversation, it won't be the same as the day that folks are seeing this. Uh, I, I, you probably saw that Neuralink, you know, e Elon Musk company, they implanted their first chip in somebody's brain. Did you know that? A human? They, no, I didn't. Yeah, th that was in the news today that the first guinea pig or what what have you, they implanted the, the, the first Neuralink chimp. Went, uh, 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 oh, no, link. you got to edit that out. Sorry, <laughs> Link went right into... <laughs> A human being's brain uh, today. Everything okay with them? Ha, 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 what if they ha, just ha. stop it at there? It's like, we implanted our first chip. How are they? Can we speak to them? Mm, no. Uh, well, they aren't telling a lot about it, but they're saying basically the person is okay, and they're not really revealing a lot about it. But the the impetus of it is that you'd be able to interface directly from the brain to the computer. 
So somebody like Stephen Hawking, for example, could just output his uh, his thoughts, and uh, you'd see, you'd see them in, on the screen, you know, bypassing the voice, by, bypassing the the fingers, uh, just yeah. direct brain uh, to to um, world. You know? Yeah, it's it's nuts. And as with any development like that, you know, you've got the you can get nuclear power plant, and you can have the nuclear bomb. It's always the the, That's right. the range of things from it. So the the positive is you bring up, you know, Stephen Hawking, people with uh, disabilities can now interface with their body, with the world better. They're not like trapped anymore. And then the downside is like, it's our phones on crack, on crack, on crack, on crack. Like imagine if you truly were always a jacked on, if you were always, you know, getting Pepsi ads in your dreams and all that kind of stuff. But I think this is just the, not to go too much on a tangent here, but I think this is destiny in a way. Like we left the ocean, we we make societies, we develop agriculture, we build the internet, and it, it's all kind of veering towards us having a collective mind while mm -hmm. retaining our individually, uh, individuality. But it's, it's the whole single-celled organism to multi-celled organism story once again this time with technologies yeah i mean what are you going to do to um be out of sequence with the actual events in your in your world and your life you can't really just drop out uh, although my generation certainly tried uh <laughs> we're famous for it you know and um and then you see like somebody like ramdas who dropped out and then end up in India and becoming a, a bridge for something that needed to happen at that time in the place anyhow. So you're always yeah. dropping out and back in. But um, I wonder sometimes if you're in a middle generation and I, I, I work a lot with even younger folk. And I, I, I think there's something in the basic language, the basic uh, communication protocols, the way people are connecting that is really changing pretty dramatically. Yeah. And for all the the complaints about the excessive um, morality or social justice warrior stuff, like the empathy, uh, you could you could see that the positive of it is like amped up empathy for everyone. Whereas mm -hmm. before it would be like, oh, those those Russians across the border, the, those those mm -hmm. Chinese. Like now it's we we don't see the most people. I think hopefully or in general we don't see people in other countries as the other. We recognize mm -hmm. that oh, they're citizens. They're, uh, they've got their um, culture and they probably don't like what the government there is doing either the same way we don't mm. like what our government is doing. So we can't mm. just put the blame on it's it's harder to go to war and have the support of of people, I think. You know, the duality is sort of mushing lava lamp melting in together and weird and sometimes what you're you're I, mean, I can get from what you're saying, you're basically an optimist, are you not? I I, uh, I don't default to it, but I'm, I subscribe to it. I, I'm mm -hmm. always trying to get philosophical with everything and finding the, the route of like, why this is, why this is good. How can we get out of this? Uh, even if it's a photo finish, it might be trending downwards, but then the last mm -hmm. second, like, oh, we turned it around, whether it was mm -hmm. <laughs> um, through, I don't think we're going to turn this, this enterprise around through everyone doing a little better. Like, okay, if you could just pick up one more can, if everyone could just turn their lights off like an hour before bed, I don't think we're doing any of that, but I think there's going to be paradigm shifts that, mm -hmm. that turn it around. And this is coming from someone with no understanding of climate change or, or carbon emission level things, but just the general feeling of that, of like, no, we can get out of this, even if it seems like we won't. So, you know, when you, you know, connect with people who are going to have to live through all this, it seems like that's one part is it's going to be challenging, but it's going to be, it's going to work through. And the other is, um, you know, I remember a young man who took a course that I was teaching up at Kripalu Institute. And then I heard, had a long conversation with about the dystopia. He was very sensitive to the dystopic element of what's been evolving. And then I heard he committed suicide the next year. You know, mm -hmm. so that, that's, it was heartbreaking because he was very bright. And, you know, who knows, there's other factors involved always, of course, in these things. But one of it was he was just looking down the barrel of a evolving situation and going, no. Yeah. Can't, can't make it. 
can't can't be abide there. So, but you seem to have a, a seed, a radioactive seed of goodness in you that's very positive. That's what I get, anyhow. Is that oh, thank to say? you. Yeah, yeah, and I, at least I want to see what happens. I can't, <laughs> I can't argue it from a rational standpoint. Like I'm sure there's people that could bring me mountains of evidence as to why the future is bad. And I'm like, no, I'm still going to put my chips on future is good. I love sci-fi. Uh, I love the rare genre of utopian sci-fi where there's still problems because so much sci-fi is about AI takes over and then we're stuck in scarcity. It's it's even more scarcity than now. And it's mm-hmm. it's really rough. And uh, there's, there's sci-fi like, you know, Accelerando or Metamorphosis of Prime Intellect where there's a a benevolent AI that solves all our problems and we're immortal. And then we have to deal with that. And then what, what do you do? What is, what does What's an example of that uh, sci-fi? Him? That one's uh, the one in particular um, metamorphosis of prime intellect is where uh, this AI is programmed with the three laws of Isaac Asimov robotics, which is um, you cannot harm any human you cannot let any human come to harm through inaction. So like if there's an opportunity to save them, you have to save them. And then the third law is you cannot harm yourself. So that means it stays alive forever and all humans stay alive forever. It, it figures out all the diseases, cancer stuff, and then it, it fixes well, it wasn't overnight. Wasn't that the premise of that Will Smith science fiction movie? The AI one? Yeah, that what you just said had the three laws of robotics. Yeah, that's where they're getting it from. So it's like an expansion on that. It's like okay. it lives in a world where Asimov was a writer and okay. this. So like, what if you actually did build that? And um, so basically, uh, long story short, overnight, once this thing gets turned on and uh, the the military decides that, oh, this has no purpose because it can't kill anyone so we're going to stop funding this thing because it can't um it can't uh be used for our purposes and then the ai realizes that oh no i'm going to be shut down i'm going to die i have to save myself and it starts thinking of like oh you know that quantum teleportation principle you guys figured out that you can do at the microscopic level there's no mathematical reason why that's limited to the microscopic level i could figure that out at scale give me one minute. And then it does for 15 minutes. It figures out how to teleport itself. It moves out of the basement. It goes to hospitals. It starts scanning people. It starts saving the whole world. And then this day is known as the change. So after the change, no one can die. And then the whole book is... This is an Asimov book? No, no, no. It's uh, I forget who wrote it, but it's a it's it's kind of a short story too. It's not even a long novel, but it just explores the idea that you can still have problems in a post scarcity world where all your uh, desires are fulfilled instantly. Like what would that look like if everything you desired was fulfilled right now and you're alive forever? Like you're, you're still stuck with yourself. Like you're not, that's, I mean, it's the Buddha story in a way and that he had everything. He was the rich prince and then right. wasn't, wasn't happy. And then, so then there's well, people it's that really in, in the Buddhist framework, it would be the God realm, Devaloka. Mm-hmm. There are six realms, and one of them is, the, you know, I wrote a book about this called Awakening from the Daydream, and it's a reframing of that teaching. But the God realms, which is where most people think is the target for spiritual development and materialistic development, leads to a very seemingly eternal, blissful situation, but it's still governed by impermanence. Yeah. Uh, so therefore, the rug is still going to be pulled at a certain point in time, even if it's eons from now. Um, and a lot of people would say, yeah, that bliss would be the target for spiritual practice. You want to achieve a blissful state. Um, but it's not sustainable. That's what's that's why it's part of the samsaric situation, the confused situation. It's not really sustainable. So yeah. you know, a lot of um uh when you talk about a uh, this uh, m- meta- the story you're talking about, um the idea that now it's permanent actually becomes claustrophobic is what you're saying yeah but before we didn't really know that we were relying on that but yeah if you are alive forever with your own thoughts experiences and um i don't know you you keep getting in your own way or perhaps there's the despair of like what's what's the point if everything what's the point of composing a symphony if i can just tell prime intellect like compose me a symphony we're seeing that with uh 
chat GPT and open AI and mid journey yeah. and stable diffusion. Like people are getting depressed that, I mean, there's the anger too. It's like, oh, it's stealing artists work and mm -hmm. it's, it's, uh, it's stealing our soul. And, um, then there's the anger of, yeah, well, what am I, what am I supposed to do now? Even if I had universal basic income, what is my purpose now that it can, can well, and do? that's why that eternalism has the seed of nihilism in it, which is the hell realm. You know, you go like, there's no point to any of this. And they say in the traditional scriptures, you know, that when, when a, 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 a being who's achieved that level of kind of uh, bliss and, you know, uh, when they get a hint of the, that they've already created the seed of, it, of their own demise in it, they crash. And they yeah. go right to hell. They don't go through the human realms or the animal realms. They just go right to like, this is a dystopia, a nightmare. And yeah. that, I think that's what that young man was seeing is that what people are trying to put together as a utopia becomes a dystopia and, and the God realm becomes the seed of the hell realm. And so according to Buddhism, anyhow, the solution is you maintain your status as a human being who has ups and downs and who has, you know, longings and disappointments. And yet there's a seed of, of real depth of wisdom and understanding and compassion in it. Yeah. So you, you bypass the God realms. It's a, it's a hard sell actually. Yeah. Straight shot to it. Do you, do you feel like it's always a trade off? Like every era it's, it's interesting to look back that, you know, before we went to blockbuster to rent our movies and then Netflix comes along and mails it to our house and then that's over. Like it doesn't mail discs anymore. Now you just stream it instantly. And now there's a hundred streaming platforms. So anything you like, so much content is available. But now we're looking like that was, those were good days though. That was a good day when we had to go there or when we played records. Like records, how about you, vinyl records, you know, we used and to going look to at the it. store. And yeah, I'm not nostalgic. It's a weird thing. I, I don't, think of that as a big part of my personal makeup is I'm interested in just staying up with what's going on and, uh, and having the conversation that's relevant to the current situation. Um, but if I were gonna, as you just led me to it, I was thinking of tower records in LA, which you, you, maybe when you were a kid, was it still there? Uh, I, I didn't live in LA at the time, but oh, we right. had a tower records when I lived in Austin and I did frequent it and it was right. At, it was right towards the end. This is wow. early two thousands. It was, you you could see it and smell it in the air, like Napster you was. Smell it. That's what I thought. Is <laughs> smell is one of these primitive senses that you just remember what the smell was like, and yeah. um, and so then you would take it home, you know, and maybe smoke a joint or whatever, and put on a new record from Cream or whoever, you know, uh, or, or or Jimi Hendrix or whatever was happening at the time, um, and there was a definite erotic or, or physical quality. But I don't miss that. Uh, like, for example, somebody just turned me on to uh, a, a cool Canadian uh, artist the other day. And it was like, boom, it's on my phone. I'm checking it out. Celine Dion? No. <laughs> <laughs> hey, boomer. <laughs> yeah. You know, in, in other words, I like the idea that you can suddenly be introduced to a whole zone of, uh, of interest and activity. Um, and I think I was put on earth a little bit to be part of the transition into that. Oh, that's good. So you're, yeah. you're not even a little bit like, cause when you say nostalgic, people interpret it as, oh, well you're, um, you know, in despair about it, but can't you be both? Can't you appreciate the now and also be like, that was a good era. I don't want everyone to be smoking cigarettes on planes now, but that right. was a cool <laughs> era. Uh -huh. We were wearing suits and we spoke to each other and there was, uh, yeah. no um gps like you just knew how to get somewhere like it was it was a fun era i yeah i, I miss i miss every era but i'm also back to yeah. the optimism I, I, i'm well, looking forward well, to how we tear this one up too well said and point taken and uh, you know if one were kind of like um you know it seems that uh you have a kind of libra mind you know like you're balancing things off as you go uh, it's a beautiful quality, and it's a, I already I already barely know you, and I appreciate it a lot. So it's um, um, you, you know, yes, you can appreciate it, the past, and you can also be very current at the same time. Yeah, that's a healthy balance. And I also do think certain things as how they were, like for example, I teach a lot of Buddhism, as you know. There's the 
doctrine, you know, and passing along ideas, and there's the transmission element of it. And I would say the transmission has weakened because it used to be you would study with a particular teacher for a considerable period of time. There was significant physical, you know, uh, you know, you're in the same place at the same time and you're watching how somebody actually handles a cup of tea or a conversation. Uh, and also then there are literal direct transmissions of teachings that are not the uh, textual or, or doctrinal part of it, but the mm. feeling and essence of it. And I think that's weakened. Personally, if I had, if I had to talk about um, teaching these days, uh, um, maybe people are not getting that much transmission. They're getting more of the doctrine, and then they're do, and a do-it-yourself kit with that. Are you saying because it's accessible online, or are you saying even in person it's weakened? Because it, as you said, there are things that like that vinyl thing. You know, when you went to the record store, there's. There's actually going someplace. There's actually offering, uh, you know, a, a, an offering or a gift. There's actually uh, putting yourself in the position of being a student and 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 kind of um, being humble and being, uh, you know, um, uh, invoking and, yeah. and, and supplicating. That those things are not valued in in the current culture because. People are very suspicious, rightly so, in many, many cases that they're being hoodwinked. Yeah. But the thing of Buddha, the basic Buddha thing is don't be hoodwinked. And there's <laughs> one thing Buddha said, it's don't be, even by me, he's saying it. And, That's and a good my, point. my teachers all said that, don't, don't, don't buy any wooden nickels, you know, here. Um, chew it on, on yourself. So, but, you know, fear of being hoodwinked shouldn't generate your relationship to the ancestry that you have, you know? No, and it, it. you've got to also have the paradox with it. It has to be the open-minded skepticism thing. Don't close off your mind and close off your heart, but also like, and I'm yeah. not saying have a knife behind your back either in that sense, but just kind of embrace that in in taking that risk that that comes with the territory. It's a risk right. to to open up. You could be hoodwinked, but to close yourself off forever, you're hoodwinking yourself because then you're you're not leaving the the, the grounds. So you yeah. what is that? That the ship ships are not safe at sea, but that is not what ships were. Oh no, the ship is safest in the harbor, but that is not what ships were built for. That's all oh. thing. Well, you know, people talk these days about safe zones, um, growth zones, and risk zones. That's something that Dharma, when we talk about those. So when somebody says, I just want to be safe, it's just the, the parable that you just uh, rendered there is a perfect example. Well, you want to stay in the harbor, so you're not going to go out into the growth zone. Yeah. And then on the other hand, you know, you put yourself at risk in certain situations uh, and in the Buddhist tradition, there are higher and higher levels of risk. You could say risk reward ratio almost, you know, um, but the ground of it is some kind of safety of like, you know, like if you took the metta practice, you know, the loving kindness practice, may you be safe. It says it right in there. May you be happy. May you be healthy. Um, so the ground is that you don't feel like you're on, you know, okay, you're sitting on ice and it's yeah. melting and you're going to end up, you know, drowning, uh, you get a nice comfortable seat in a, in a cottage or a house and you have a cushion and you have a ground, but your mind is still always in the risk zone <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> by its own nature. Yeah. That's how we, that's how we got here as uh, through evolution is because the, when you hear a rustle in the, in the bushes, you know, so, sometimes I'm wondering like when I'm about to say something, I'm like, Oh crap, did I already hear you say that? Am I just saying your quote back to you from two podcasts ago? But uh, yeah, our the, basically the anxiety and neurosis is what kept us alive for a million years because the ancestors that were neurotic were the ones that survived and the ones that were like, oh, let's just go see what the sound is without being careful about it. That that line didn't reproduce. Yeah, and the, uh, I mean, there's at the at the physical level, it's obvious, easy to track. We're in danger, uh, you know, by being alive. Yep. at risk by being a lot you you get born um and uh then you're going through a bunch of harrowing experiences <laughs> and after this with short respites of uh, feeling like okay i'm cool now um you we, we were talking about puberty before you, you came on you know god what a risk zone that is you just like 
your whole body changing, your whole energy changing. Uh, what about graduating from college and realizing that, like when my son graduated from college and when I graduated from college, my father said, nice to know you basically. <laughs> I don't mean, you know, emotionally, but like, how about you're entering the risk, the, the uh, growth yeah. stuff now and you got to take care of yourself. So, yeah. So, um, what co- coming back to that, you're, you're clearly somebody who's a creative. Uh, would you would you say that your job is to create stuff? Oh yeah, hundred percent. And okay. I don't say that in any type of important way. I think you know the creativity is, and everybody can tap into it. But I would say that is of of the the three things: creativity, spirituality, and making a buck. I would feel like I'm most of my chips are in the creative, and then I could do a little better with the spiritual and the making a buck part. Okay, which is what this book is all about, just so you know. <laughs> Because I hear that from a variety of people. I myself am an artist. I'm a musician, obviously, a composer, guitar player. So Berkeley I had college become, of music. Yes, and then and from then on into the wild world of uh, television, film, records, you know, and and you know, uh, trying to put it together as a livelihood, and study, you know, Buddhism at the same time, which is saying, hey, some of the Buddhists say, just don't get involved with that stuff. That's just the red dust world. It's just, uh, you know, you become a renunciate like, like Buddha did or like the monks do. So, um, how to integrate that. So when you say you're a creative, uh, and, and you, you could use tuning in the, in in your spiritual practice and, and your, your livelihood dimension, I get to be like, this is just who I am all ears. And I want to hear all about it. Um, about which part the creativity part or about the wanting to, uh, the, the tune uh, in <laughs> the crossing over because it's clear that or maybe it's not clear that your relationship to your creativity is pretty healthy oh but, yeah i would say so you know I, you let it flow you let it come i feel like in a way i've always been like that i was um not i wasn't a delinquent i wasn't failing out of school but in a in a family with, you know, they've got PhDs, my brother's a professor, always honor student, uh, cousins, all that. Like my, my family is very academic and they, they perform well in school. And I found myself to be more of a, a black sheep in that way. And I was more of the doodler. I wanted to uh, play instruments. I, I didn't have a plan of like how this would make money, but that stuff just always was so much more important to me. And those were my heroes like musicians were my heroes artists were my heroes i just looked up to that so much more and i i always felt better when i was engaging in that stuff as opposed to and you fearlessly jumped into it you allowed yourself to not be dominated by this other um you know gestalt of like hey you got to do this and you got to be linear and you got to be conventional and you got to make x amount of dollars a year you just went i'm drawing right now everybody i'm sorry (laughs) Yeah, I tried the other way. I just freeze up. And even in mm. the, like, let's take, I, I think about in the realm of stand up comedy, like when I was most in it, I was mm. given the opportunity to um, submit a packet for SNL, you know, Saturday Night Live. And I'm like, oh, this could, this could be great. Like, I could be on SNL, I could become a writer for it, or I could, maybe I could be a featured player or a cast. And then I'm like looking at the writer's packet and, it just looked like homework to me, the having to write a a, a celebrity sketch, a current events sketch. This like it, it's very specific, and there's yeah. people that can do both. There's people that right. can do their own voice, and they're good at writing for that. But for me, I like just I couldn't do a single part of it. I just stared at it every day. I'm like, what's wrong with you? This is supposed to be your yeah. your dream. So even stuff within what you thought was your your dream, sometimes you can't even conform yeah, to that. Just- it was this too straight in a way for yeah you know, yeah it didn't have enough curved space in it you know yeah and um, I always liked originals too like you know Jimi Hendrix original um, Joni Mitchell original um, j- j- just on and on like people that are in their own lane a hundred percent and you know that they're yeah. they they brought to the world something the world never even asked for the world wasn't like oh it'd be great if we had some Jimi hendrix right now yeah. it was just like the world is one way and then the next day a new color is introduced like oh i didn't even know i needed that and mm. there it is and people tapping into that i call that of themselves i call that ramin 
Nebuchadnezzar the first. <laughs> you know, but you do have a house. You're in L.A., right? And, yeah. Uh, we won't say where you live in case there's any like, you know, um, people who <laughs> would want to find you for yeah, sure. nefarious purposes. I have the high ground. Okay. <laughs> you have to get up a lot of stairs. <laughs> But also, but, I don't think your listeners are maniacs. Maybe a couple. Oh, oh gosh. Who, you know, there's every every variation known. But we have gathered a really nice uh, gathering of satsang, as you called it, in general. Um, but you have to pay your rent on that house, or do you own the house? I have to pay rent on this house. Okay. So yeah. how does that happen? How does that happen? Um, I sell books i sell shirts i sell uh oracle deck oh, i've got some here this is my oracle deck the rainbow brain skull oracle Love deck it. rainbow um, brain I've, skull oracle deck I'm yeah in. i've got compilations of my my drawings in various books i have i believe 10 books right now uh i never set out to be a you know a publisher of many books i was just kind of doing my thing and then a book emerged from it. And then right. over time, people are asking like, oh, can you sell prints? Can you sell shirts? Right. Can you sell this? Can you sell stickers? And I, I added stuff based on demand. And then a decade or so later, I'm like looking at this, wow, I've got this little pirate ship of stuff that I'm selling. And I occasionally do commission work. So I draw stuff for other people for like a music festival or do an animation for litter robot or uh, a musician putting out a record or a podcast cover or just stuff like that eventually uh i was doing less and less of and then doing more of my own running my little business of um the various items i just talked about but yeah i haven't had a real honest job in over a decade and whoa whoa okay see so i'm gonna interrupt there that is an honest job it is, but it, uh, it's one of those things of, uh, you know what I mean. Like, I'm, I don't have a boss. I don't have an alarm clock. I don't show up to a building every day. I don't have cake on Sandy's birthday and discuss the latest gossip at the water cooler. It's, it's <laughs> just me. It. And <laughs> But how you approach generating your livelihood and your revenue from that has, you know, a wide range of possibilities. That's and true. I you will know. say I'm a professional. You know that uh, yeah. Stephen Pressfield book of the professional shows up every day. Mm -hmm. And the reason if you're a professional accountant versus a professional guitar player is because you're showing up to the accounting job every day. Mm -hmm. Even if you don't like it, you are a professional. You right. you you wake up and you go to it because if you don't, then you're, you're going to be fired. And you have to treat your independent art job that way too. I have to show up every single day, even if I don't feel like it. Otherwise, I'm fired. And you're also wearing the invisible armor of an entrepreneur in that, you know, you're showing up for how do you create revenue from your creativity. And there's a wide range there. And it's like um, some people have gotten very wealthy doing things like that. Oh, yeah, they have. Yeah, there's, you know, there's both. There's, there's a full spectrum, don't you think? There's 100% the full spectrum and the inverse of it. So I think that there's there's people who are not technically skilled that have made millions on their work. There's people who are very technically skilled and they live on the street. There's people, you know, that they can draw your face in three seconds, but they just live on a street corner. Like, oh, that guy's really talented. I don't know why this guy lives on the street. Mm -hmm. And um, there's both. There's people who are very technically talented and make money and then there's of course the obvious one is the people with the no talent and the no money that's a lot of people can can fit <laughs> into that like oh that's a bunk deal but it's it's important to remember that they can have that nothing to do with yogi, each other though. that could be a great yogi there yeah he's just got to rebrand it's no all talent about no money but great wisdom or something you know yeah yeah but so you, it's interesting uh you know for me personally i just like this part of the thing where uh, enough to have written a, a book about it and start a podcast to have the conversation. And I do counsel people one-to-one -one quite a lot of, of where, okay, we just want to build up this area a little bit because it's a different toolbox. You know yeah. that like to sell your books is a different toolbox than toolbox than creating them. They're interdependent, but you know, 
And sometimes people just haven't had that training in that aspect. And it's yeah. not a it's not a big job to 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 you know find out where you know just like you know how to um, uh, craft a piece of work, um, crafting uh, distribution or crafting marketing is not that different from it, but it is a, it is distinct in a way. Yeah, it's a different type of fear you have to face, um, but uh-huh. it all just boils down to fear. But let's say you're. Uh, the fear of the vulnerability of sharing a, a work, whether it's a song or a, a visual thing that's from a deep, vulnerable place like that, that involves confronting fear. And then there's the fear of selling, which then your fear is the world is going to think that I'm trying to make a book, which I am. I'm not only trying to make a book, but of right. course, I'm not selling it at cost. Right. You're, it's a it's arbitrage. At the end of the day, I'm selling paper that right. the paper does not have as much value as when you put the ink on the paper. And the ink on the paper, like when you when you're boiling it down to its component parts, it's like, hey, you're selling it for more than cost. Like, yeah, that's the that's the grift because yeah. I have to make the money so that I can pay the rent, which is also right. a grift because the mortgage of the guy that owns the building is right. less than or equal to the. So it's all a uh, sure. Uh, you have to sell it for more than the cost but it should be happy on both sides like i do that too i buy stuff from people and i'm aware that it's selling it at higher than cost but i'm happy at the end of the day and that should be the goal is you want people that buy stuff from you to be happy with it and you should be happy with the amount they're paying it shouldn't be like oh i didn't make enough so i'm i'm resenting this person for buying it this cheap and they shouldn't be resenting you for Paying too and, much. And you know, be- when you think about it, you do feel that way if you go to a restaurant and get a good meal, or if you buy a sweater or a pair of shoes. You feel like some kind of honest exchange has happened that shouldn't be embarrassing for either party. Um, yeah. But the fear is interesting. So the fear, I you I think you identified two f- kinds of fear there in what you said. One is, am I good enough? Can am I a what I would call imposter syndrome or yep. poverty mentality, right? Uh, and then the other would be, um, you know, just do I, uh, what do other people think? Yeah. And Especially at, and when, when the world gets, uh, chaotic, the world is always chaotic, but if you just work at a job, world events don't affect you as much to showing up the job, but let's say you're promoting a new book and no. it's on the day or the week of a new global catastrophe. <laughs> like that that sucks. It's like, oh, I'll wait for one week until we've uh, habituated to it and then announce it. Or I just dive in and be like, hey, my book just dropped today, even though there's bombs going off in the background. Oh, and that's funny. People are all sharing flags of certain natures. It's like, oh, what do you do? And I've kind of, I'm, I'm the more uh, lean into it type of thing. Like even if there's criticism, but I... I don't sell as much as I could. I feel like I leave a lot of money on the table. I don't mm. advertise and promote as much as I should because of the fear, but because because I don't get complaints about it. If I was doing it enough, I would get some people saying like, all right, enough already with the trying to sell stuff. But I've mm-hmm. avoided that so heavily that I get yeah, okay. no criticism. And thus, I uh, I wait too long. I don't accumulate wealth. I make enough and then i chill for months and then it's like oh no i checked the bank account i should probably be making some money right now if i want to continue to pay for all this so i i don't i don't hoard i make enough and then i wait too long and then uh i scramble yeah you know first thought best thought when you i'm thinking um you know i have a uh Tai Chi teacher named Sat Han here in New York, and he's, you know, he's kind of quite uh, deeply studied in in classical Chinese arts and application of contemporary life, and really kind of a, a major um, wonderful uh, teacher for me. And I asked him, you know, about vegetarianism, and he said you should look at the teeth that you have, and that should be the balance of food groups that you eat. So you have the incisors, which is for tearing meat, you know, and you have the, the molars, which is for grinding grains and so forth. Mm. And to, to look at your natural makeup as a way for creating the balance that you're talking about, you know. And so I use the body in my book as a way of talking about 
the different elements of of having of being in a business, which you are. You're, you're an artist, but you're also in the in, a, in the business of being an artist, and that <clears throat> the notion of balancing creativity with sales and marketing, uh, you know, in a healthy way, and marketing is just letting people know that you know. For example, I'm going to say we're going to post your website up on this um, on this podcast, and we're going to say. Let's go check this cool guy's stuff out, and it's cool stuff. And I know people are going to look at it and go, "That's cool." And then they're going to go, "Your website is set up to buy things." I saw that already. Oh and yeah. Who needs to be embarrassed about nothing there? You know what I mean? It's like that's a healthy kind of thing. But then, um, you know, backing. I think what I'm feeling is, who cares what other people think on a certain level? That's a there's a certain amount of health in letting that go. Yeah, there definitely is. And yeah. er- everything with balance, like you you don't want to scare everyone off and um, just be completely your unhinged reptile brain self. <laughs> but you you don't want to present, uh, you don't want to fool people either. Like you don't want to present yourself as a wonderful uh, person with no flaws. There's this Patrice O'Neill bit. It's funny where he talks about your first thought or your first feeling is your real feeling. Your second feeling is you trying to fool God into thinking you're a wonderful person. Like you just <laughs> o- over, override it and bury it up. It's like, no, that, that first feeling is still part of you. You got to address it yeah. and be there with it. Yeah. Uh, my teacher used to say first thought, best thought. And it's the same, same exact iteration. First mm. thought, best thought. And, uh, you know, um, we we would do poetry slams with Allen Ginsberg, you know, and first thought, best cool. thought, you know, like what, 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 you know, and your creativity clearly has first thought energy to it, right? Your art yeah. has a lot of first thought think, energy there, right? Not, not, not to get pretentious about it, but I would even say it's like, it's pre-thought, like you want to get oh. it somewhere before your brain can, and that's, that's the type of comedy I like too. It's the type that you laugh at before your brain can start putting the things right. together because some of the worst comedy is when it's clever and in your mm-hmm. head, you're like, Oh, I see what you did mm-hmm. there. And then maybe you give a courtesy laugh, but that's not what you want. You want it to come from the deep soul of someone like almost to where you close oh. your mouth or you didn't, you didn't think you're, you're allowed to laugh at that. Not, not being mean to groups of people, but you know, just know it's like, Oh, I didn't, that came out of nowhere. I didn't see that right. coming. Well, and we have a practice called suddenly free from fixed mind. And a, a, a training. I like that workshop. title. Workshop, but but that is a sort of way of getting at the pre-thought level, because when you you know when you let go of a train of thought, there is a gap before the next one comes in, and that's yeah. pre-thought. It's 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 between thoughts. Um, and the interesting thing about that part of the mind, most people don't pay attention to that part of the experience, but it is the most natural uh, aspect of. The mind and it's also uh, quite vivid and aware without having uh, to contextualize something. So you know, there's been a plane flying across the sky. Uh, here I'm looking at the East River from where I'm sitting, and it's the first time I noticed there's a flight path there, and there's been like ten planes since I noticed it. And then there's <laughs> a gap of not noticing it, and then I just see the sky. You know, yeah. So there's space highlights, you know, and Creative people, we're we're helping people to get back to the kind of raw space of just suddenly free from fixed mind and the joy that that in, brings together for people. And um, then when you move into a more intentional thing of like, okay, setting up your website, things like that, for for sometimes for creative people, that part's a drag. Yeah, not not even. Uh, I mean, yeah, setting up the website, having to post it places, having to do customer service emails and um so so much of what you have to do in any career you feel like you're escaping it when you leave your 9 to 5 job and you wind up right back where you started like oh the stuff that is required to run a business is always always there and i know it can be solved through delegation but i think that's another block not of, completely yeah i guess not cuz you're you're still communicating with the delegator there's no there's the no person, disconnecting. The person yourself. you delegate to could like, you know, I could tell you a million stories from the music business of like, oh boy, that was a mistake. <clears throat> oh, they scammed people in the music industry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, and the, one of the first things somebody told me when I was getting into being like a professional songwriter is, "Music business is two words." 
Oh, that's good. <laughs> that was a good piece of advice. And, you know, <clears throat> I, I also know that some people, I, I quote Charles Ives, <clears throat> excuse me, in my um, book as a composer, great classical composer, 20th century early. And um, he was an insurance salesman because he did not want that pressure on his creative work. He wanted to just write what he wanted to write. Oh, and interesting. With, yeah, so that's a model that's cool. But if you are in, in the game, so to speak, and you're doing it, how can you do it in a way that doesn't betray you? you yeah. Know, that doesn't betray your intention and your heart. And um, I've seen people get really pulled off that subtly and they start looking. It, it's reading the reviews, you know, that does it. Yeah. And Don't read the reviews. <laughs> and the the potential for for divinity is so high too because we just mm -hmm. worship musicians because it it taps into a deep part of us but i feel like of all of the things like you know authors comedians movie stars um uh visual artists musicians i feel like that's the one that we let get away with the most stuff like uh, when when you feel like a musician had a scandal or something you know chris yeah. brown or or michael jackson or just any anything it's like yeah but but still where we we hold them in a in a different place. It's true, and and um, uh, that is a trap. People get get in, begin to, and you see some great musicians who are very humble still and modest and 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 honest in that way. But boy, you know, the Buddha before he got enlightened, they, they was seduced by what's called Mara, the daughters of Mara. And they're just going, look, there's all kinds of alternatives for you, baby. You know, mm -hmm. you could be rich, you could be famous. Well, let's just slow this train down here towards like complete authenticity uh, and wakeful uh, behavior. You could have X, Y, Z. And uh, he had to kind of like snap out of it, you know? Yeah. So I that means that it became a renunciate path. But I think that's a mistake uh, in the big picture. It doesn't mean it has to be a renunciate path. And there's a lot of instances of Buddha teaching non-renunciate practitioners in a worldly way to just not uh, to be in that stuff, but not uh, necessarily caught up in it. But it's very tricky, right? Oh, yeah. It's the, it's the yeah. trickiest and it never never ends as we see with you know, uh, musicians that have taken their own lives or ones that are just mm -hmm. still, um, you know, bent on uh, attached to substances because they have to maintain the high of their uh, most worshipped moment. Oof. Yeah. Ouch. I don't yeah, know. I had some other thought with it, but it's gone. But that's good. Yeah. That's good if a thought is gone. Oh, I did want to ask when when you were mentioning the the, the gap between mm. uh, thoughts. Do you think there is a plonk length, a, a minimum distance gap, or is the division between gaps infinite? There's like no. Yeah, there's I, no I, end. What a great to question. There's a whole <clears throat> study in the Buddhist literature called Abhidharma, which is the patternings of the way the mind takes shape. It's very detailed. And and could be quite scholarly, but it's also revealing. So that they say that it's 128th of a second. That's how is, how little it gets. A frame of mind. Because of is the limitation the speed of light? Do you think? Because that's how. I don't. I don't know if it's even literal. And like you could say it's instantaneous too. That would be. Um, there's something they call the fourth moment. Because there's the past, the present, the future. And a lot of the spiritual people say the present, the present, the present. Mm. But actually, when you look for the present, you can't find it. It was already gone. So sometimes that teaching is like, it's already gone. Oh, I and, like that. The that's fifth called beetle. the fourth moment. Yeah, the yeah. fifth beetle is the, <laughs> is the fourth moment. That's cool. Yeah. And and so that allows you to not fixate on the present even as a, as a thing. Yeah. And I would I say guess, that kind of mind is instantaneous in, in some sense from our sense of time. Be, uh, it would be. Uh, the, 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 what was it? 100th of a 28th of a, one well, one hundred twenty eighth of a second. That analogy is being used to um, describe mental events. Yeah. You know, like we, and the analogy would be like video or, or film. It's like 24 frames a second and you see it as continuous. Right, so right. What we're saying is that it's not actually continuous. It's boop, 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 and you're streaming yeah. it together. It's streaming. Uh, so it's basically digital. 
mind is right. digital from, from the from the point of view of the event horizon of the mind it's digital it's not analog it's not continuous that's why you can interrupt it with you know meditation practice or just a kind of awareness practice you just go hey i i just broke the flow and i was thinking about my grandmother and now i'm thinking about um you know my trip to hawaii and what happened in between i wasn't really paying attention to what happened in between yeah so we begin to pay attention to that quality of space and awareness that's not 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 formatted, unconditional um, uh, awareness. And, and you uh, can notice it. It's it's something you can notice. And I remember Ram Dass had some rap about uh, we're, we're pursuing pleasure. You're trying to get those gaps shorter and shorter in between each other so that the the moments of pleasure are are touching because you know heaven forbid there be a space in between the the that's pleasure moments good. yeah that's pretty yeah and that's i think saying the same thing in a way but it could be pain also it, it's just something definitive you go i know where i am i know who i am i have an identity i have a location i have a a, a moment in time and space where I, I am who i am and there's a certain sort of false bottom security to that that we are pretty pretty well addicted to in this particular uh yeah. way of being but if you, if you begin to permeate that, you do open up to some kind of uncertainty, and um, um, that can have its own form of uh, of uh, attraction. People are with attraction to uncertainty. Yeah. How so? Well, why do you think people are taking you know psychedelics, for example? Oh, that's true. Yeah, you want you want the monotony to melt. You you, you want some kind of Wow! Did you see that frog just jump out of my, you know, of, of my underpants? You know, <laughs> <laughs> no, because it's in your mind. That's why nobody else saw it. Yeah. So uncertainty is you're not even sure what's actually happening or who you are. I remember a, a friend of mine was going through a really difficult breakup and he read this book. I don't remember the name of the book, but it it gave him this epiphany of. Basically, when it feels like the floor is falling from underneath you and everything is chaotic, that's that's true reality. The other one where you had certainty and routine and repetition and certainty, that is that's the illusion. So when you're in that place that's falling, like kind of get used to it. It's like, no, it's okay. This is the nature of actual reality. The other one is an illusion. You will be back in that illusion. You will feel comfort again, but learn to be comfortable with the the floor falling realm. Yeah, the, the um <clears throat> any of it can be solidified into a kind of wishful thinking because it gives you ground but what you're saying essentially as i understand it, is that the fundamental situation is groundless yes and 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 yet we're not completely comfortable with that at this point in our you know manifestation so we create ground out of relationships we create ground out of identity we create ground out of um you know uh, narrative yeah right but the ground is that's not the real ground and the real ground is unconditional and to to experience that is actually has its own form of <clears throat> come to come home to mama energy yeah yeah you know like you, you and people do take psychedelics to to break through to to that unconditional quality of their experience, no? Oh yeah, yeah. Have you have you taken psychedelics today? No, but uh, in general. <laughs> <laughs> now, right before you said that was the gap. Was there? Oh yeah, that was the gap. <clears throat> it was fast because you. I have I have funny, taken but, right. I have taken psychedelics, but I'm um, I I don't. Uh, I guess I don't talk about them a whole lot and it's not it's not out of um not liking them or not thinking they're helpful. I think just uh I, I'm aware of also it can become a crutch or who knows what your state is when you take them. So I don't sure. I don't prescribe it as a cure all. Um I don't think we should spray the air with it and everyone trip <laughs> all of a sudden. A another Ram Dassism from before, I think him and Tim Leary both were talking about how if uh if we could dose everyone, then we're we're optimistically less than ten years away from total human enlightenment. And then, of course, the seventies, eighties happens, and okay, it totally disproved that. Yeah, <laughs> that's been vetted. 
but they're good yeah. though. I like I like them. I, I I think it's good to do once a year or once every six months. It's a good mm-hmm. reset if you're in the right space for it. But it's how much disruption we allow into our, you know, into our world, and then not look at it as destruction, but disruption for a creative uh, end. You know, of of liberating, opening up possibilities. You know, uh, how much do you trust yourself? How much do you trust the world you live in to to uh, come together again in a way that's not like a nightmare or a dystopia? Yeah. You know, how much letting go we could actually do? And um, of course, it's related to dying. Yeah, you do die. The version I mean, of you before you took it is dead afterwards. And literally, you know, <clears throat> the death is the thing that people are horrified about, you know, terrified of. Yeah, because that's that's our main, uh, our biological is isness is it is everything revolves around not die. I mean, it's reproduce and not die. That's like every drive in us is like, don't don't die, reproduce, don't die, reproduce. Like, okay, but I gotta override that a little bit for long term. It's like, okay, we'll override it for for this long, but just well, avoid I have pleasure. Already, seek I, I have already reproduced. I mean, and. As far as I can tell, when I die, my son won't necessarily die. Oh, yeah. But you mean, I, but I will about... die. I will die. So I yes. think reproducing is not the answer, is what I'm saying. Okay. It doesn't solve that particular problem. Oh, but I, but I mean, the just the drive is in there. Of course, it doesn't solve the problem, but it's that's that's what our bodies think. You think it's that when confronted with death, the first thing you want to do is figure out how to have a baby? <laughs> no, no, not like that. I'm saying that, uh, that it's part of the overarching brand of not dying is the the reproduction part. Basically, why we why we run from discomfort or why we're afraid to be vulnerable all like goes back to the fear of death, doesn't it? Yes, and I, but I guess I'm saying I think it's independent of the reproductive uh, paradigm. We are afraid to let go and to cease to be in the way that's familiar to us. At every step of the game, every conversation we have is marked by that. Every passing year is marked by that. Every sneeze is, oh, God, I, you know, I'm going to die. I mean, you know, they even say, God bless you when you sneeze. Yeah. <laughs> You're going to die. So anyhow, not to get too morbid about the whole thing, but in terms of uh, comedy, which is, a, you know, when you said uh, people revere musicians and give them a wide swath, you know who musicians revere, right? Comedians. Isn't that true? A hundred percent. It's it's uh both wish they were each other. Like rock stars really wish they were funny. And then uh comedians <laughs> are 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 fantasizing about being a poster on the wall and the elevated yeah. stage and like the sustaining that one note for yeah for three minutes and uh people requesting the old stuff. Like, because comedians are like, oh, that's so great. You guys get to just play the same song for 30 years and people love it. <laughs> and like, are you kidding? I hate this song. I don't want to play this song anymore. I can't get away. I can't do a single set where they don't request this song. So comedian, it's a magic trick. It's got to be new, fresh, always. And then musician, it's like, we don't want to hear your new stuff. Well, and and then isn't it true for a comedian that it has to be funny? Uh, I used to think so, but... <laughs> That's, I mean, I guess there've been some people who played with the edges of that. That this is not really that funny. Um, yeah, like, no, no, no. Know. It does, it does have, it does have to be funny. And um, yeah, it's it's sustaining an energy level. Whereas, yeah, music, it it doesn't have to sustain like the intensity the whole time. It can kind of go in and out of intensity, right. and yeah, attention can either even wander a little bit during a music set. Whereas comedy, there can be no portion during the hour that you'd want people talking amongst themselves at the table right. <laughs> maybe a little jab maybe like oh you do that, <laughs> that, that and, and, and why did, did you give up being a comedian no not at all i'm i'm just less less of my eggs are in that basket and oh, I, I don't think i've ever given up anything i haven't given up music or uh or comedy it's just i'm i'm doing fewer sets than i was doing uh, five years ago, um, I haven't still, been uploading. You still go clips. up sometimes. Yeah, and I want to record another hour this year. We'll see if I do it. Like I never, I never do. Not that's not true. 
not I never do what I'm going to say, but there's a lot of things I tell myself I'm going to do, and there simply is not room for all of them. And how it plays out is anybody's guess because it's subject to that version of me that day. Have you ever done this? I'm I'm playing with this idea of, and I didn't invent it, but the basically you're you're not the narrative of all your previous days. Like I act like I just quantum leaped into this version of me not even today, like right now, like I, I have memories and I have objects of like, oh, who was this person? Okay, interesting. How can we go from here? And not carrying the baggage of I have been this person for decades. It's just, That's I, what we I, mean by suddenly free from fixed mind. There we go. Cool. I yeah. called it quantum leaped into this me, That's but it. suddenly free from fixed mind. That's even better. Yeah, that Well, and that's just way, you know, one particular teacher framed it, but there are many, many ways of saying that in the particularly in the tantric Buddhist tradition, it's like the transmission is that um, pointing out, they call it pointing to the nature of mind, pointing out instructions, that there really is no continuity Mm. to, to, to the mind. It's not, that is a sort of another level of it, but actually the actual nature of the mind is just spontaneous awareness in this present moment. That's the actual nature of your mind. Mm. Do you, do you, this, this might be a, a jump, but do you think therefore we're not going to be able to replicate it with our little toys, with technology and AI, we'll only be able to come up with an impression of it and we'll never be able to do it because we're trying to make it a continuous boxed in, like we're making an artificial general intelligence Wham, or is it? I've I've been I've contemplated that because you know obviously we're going to have to deal with the fact that um, in so many other ways it's going to be able to duplicate what we do and far surpass it fairly quickly. So this aspect of access to non-conceptual awareness would be um, as the sort of and they say all sentient beings potentially have it. It's not just humans; it's the ground of the whole situation. People call it different things, but um, uh, would a machine intelligence be able to uh, have that experience and therefore become sentient? I think that would be, a, for me, that would define sentience. Not that it can think well, it, that it could not think. Mm. If you could not think, then you're sentient, but stay aware. That's how I define sentience. Uh, could it access that? Um, you know, I'm watching a bunch of the sci-fi and some of the indie sci-fi stuff and they're playing around these ideas and uh, I'm not sure would be my my ultimate statement. Um, ultimately, we, I've been feeling a lot like we're biological machines. We're some kind of machine. You know, you I see people, they're different, they're part, they need parts replacement. I had cataract, cataract surgery. Is, is that am I an organic being now? Because I have these <laughs> lenses that are manufactured. I have mesh around my gut from an, a hernia operation. Like 10, hey, 10 me too. You you had a hernia? Yeah, had it twenty sixteen. W- woke up to the election results. It was a surreal time because right. I go under anesthesia and then wake up and then it's like Trump declared winner. I'm like, oh, this is <laughs> this is interesting. Maybe you could take some more of that anesthesia before the next election and have a different outcome would be really cool. Oh, but, I would do it if it was not a hernia. That's not fun. But you're already a hybrid you know, teeth, you know. Uh, are, some of these are mechanical replacements, you know, glasses. Glasses, uh, so, yeah. So when you talked about the singularity, you know, at a very crude level, we're ready into it because we're using uh, manufactured goods to supplement our biological reality. But the singularity is saying, could you, could they operate the, the, the could they be the CEO of the core operating system? Could you replace your brain? That would be a, that would be a perfect example of what you're talking about. Yeah, or I guess I'm speaking more to the you know the felt presence of immediate experience, which it's impossible to know other than your own felt presence of immediate experience, that whole thing of like, I don't know if you're a real person. I Like you you could be, this could all be a simulation. It was all yeah. me. And it's perhaps all of that. Like we're all the God self, the infinite creator witnessing through the various that it is. And time is all one thing. And we're just witnessing it at linear. And yeah all that uh, subjectively, but can a machine, like, can it be like, I, I am, can the machine really feel that I amness? And I don't know, I guess there's no so way. So much of what know. we experience as I amness is 
is a distortion that the two questions you should separate out is could a machine become confused with the <laughs> I am, you know, delusional, or could the machine um, become, you know, really you're talking about some kind of enlightenment or, or have that kind of level of real knowledge and real deep wisdom. And I don't know. One part of me thinks it's happened already many times. So, oh, so you, know, you, you mean like 20,000 years ago or you mean uh, recently? hundred a million years. I don't know. Time has a different meaning. But for example, in Buddhism, they say there's a thousand Buddhas and Shakyamuni Buddha was the fourth in the garland of Buddhas. And the fifth one is Maitreya is supposed to come in like 300 years. But the sense of time is not conventional. Huh. We have a very conventional sense of time, but time might be more you know, multidimensional than, than we allocate. So I'm not really freaked out by any of it. That's the truth. I'm not as worried. That, that as taps into your not nostalgicness. Yeah, you're not nostalgic, yeah. and you're not fearful of the the Bring future. It. Bring it. I like that. Yeah. I, I try to be that myself, and yeah. I think I naturally am for the most part. And I don't. I, I have to kind of pretend sometimes because you can come off as a bad person if you're not worried. Mm. It's like very moral to be worried of, like oh, I'm so worried about, and then you present all this evidence because the alternative is like, well, you're not going to do anything about the evidence that the yeah. future is bad. Like I'll do, I'll help you right now because you're standing right in front of me. But yeah, well, look, what'll impress me more is if a if a machine learning system can outdo you with your artwork, outdo you with your um, uh, you know, creative literature, your comedy. What would impress me more is if it could have as good a heart as you seem to have. Uh, as I seem to have, not the actual well, one. I don't want to presume. Good today. I can't say what's actually true. I can just say what what appears to be true to me, but you know, that would be like, can you imagine like uh, like a a robot with AI taking care of a child? And would it be a good caretaker for a child? And you go, and it's making decisions to protect the child, and it's making decisions to educate and to nurture. Um, that would be more interesting to me than if it could duplicate the, the sort of uh, toxic masculine aspect of cognition, you know? <laughs> Good way of putting it. Yeah. yeah. But that, yeah, that is, that is more useful and more impressive. And these are all separate things, whether it's, whether it is a mirror of us as an experiencer of I am, whether it is impressive or whether it is good, because it can be impressive. Like, oh, that thing just shot a hundred thousand people in two seconds. That's yes. impressive. I don't yeah. like that. I don't think it should be doing that, but I'd be lying if I say I was not impressed by that feat of destruction. And horrified. Yeah. Yeah. So, and there's no doubt it's going to be able to do that. No, in my mind, you know, that's clearly yeah. do that's doable. So, yeah. Can you can you take take care of my? Uh, I'm going out for uh, a walk. Could you take care of my child? Yeah. That would be that. That would be like okay. Wow. Deep. We've reproduced the kind of mother lineage, you know, uh, of of nurturing, you know. Um, uh, and we all need that. I, I don't know anybody who doesn't need that more than they need to be a smart ass, you know? Yeah. Like the uh the Dalai Lama quote of do I have too many quotes? Doesn't matter. But the 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 world does not need more successful people. It needs more kind people. And we're always searching for success. Or Victor Wooten said uh his mother said, What does the world need with another good musician? Like you might just be chasing, like how can you be technically impressive as a musician? Uh -huh. But yeah. what what does the world need with that? Like what can you actually provide that the world needs? The world needs to allow its heart to be broken, and and to recognize. You know, it's funny because the mother thing. I mean, I may not be popular for genderizing this, and I don't mean to necessarily genderize it beyond the physical, uh, but the heart level. You know, we're we're all um, giving birth and we're all taking care of this place and these people and our friends. And there's nothing more beautiful than that period over and out. I'm done. Yeah. And I think it's still fun to talk with with gender genders as energies. And I think even the people who are the most gender ideologue, da 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 da, da 
uh, people accept that and will say like, I'm in my masculine right now. I'm in my okay. feminine, yeah. this feminine energy, masculine energy, feminine it's still, being. It's still, it's still cool to, to, to articulate that that way? I think. I think so. I'm not Gen Alpha, but I could be wrong. Like this clip could be played in three years and I'm like, just the worst. I can't believe he said that. But no, I don't think. Um, but but I, I get the hesitation, like when there is touchiness around a certain topic and you don't want to go into it. It's like, oh, can we still use gendered language when we're speaking about energies? Yeah. Like, I, I think you can if you're. I'm very humble at this point about all that. I learned it a certain way. Uh, I learned a sort of cosmic in, in tantric Buddhism. They do talk about feminine and masculine principles. It's a part of the duality of Tantra, you know, that you don't mush it all together. It's just all one thing. There is articulation of, of um, you know, the kind of polarity as being a dynamic thing. Um, but I know that I'm on the way out, you know, uh, you know, so I'm cool with that actually. <laughs> uh, but, but um, you know, I'm very curious, you know, too. Like, so when you said what you said, I like, I, I know of this non binary uh, person, and I would like to have that talk about with that person about masculine and feminine at the energetic level. But I'm, I'd be a little concerned about not, you know, wanting to, you know, uh, violate any kind of uh, wisdom that has come about that is uh, obsoleting my perspective. Yeah. yeah I, I, I think I'd, I'd rather get out of the way, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Yeah, you just you want to not have any last second things of uh, like oh god, you know. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I saw Carlos Santana had a little moment where, where he was just in between songs saying like uh, a man is a man and a woman is a woman and what you do in the closet that that doesn't uh, or some version of like what you do in the closet doesn't matter to me and just the fact that he used the phrase like what you do in the closet implying like stay in yeah. stay in the closet with the stuff he got. Yeah, uh, no, it's easy. Uh, it's bashing easy, for that. It's easy to um to miss the moment in in you know. So I tend to use my ears more than my mouth in this particular <laughs> area good. these days. Um, listen, what a treat. Um, the, the, you know, one thing about the podcast is people are getting to meet each other, maybe and talk and chat in a way, and other people get to listen in. Um, but I'm I'm um really happy to have met you, and um, <clears throat> really appreciate Me too. Your, your, you know, what you're doing and the work you're doing. And I think it's that thing of like, things get born out of these, you know, connections happen. And uh, uh, hopefully we, we keep in touch and we can keep posted about the evolution of all the things we're talking about. Yeah, um, you want to come on my show too? I'd be, I'd be, for example, I'd be delighted to. Let's do it. Okay. You just, you invite me, I, I'll be there. Simple you got it. That. Okay. This this is the this is the actual invitation, and then the scheduled invitation will be in the email. Okay, wonderful. Um, so thank you so much for joining us for this brief period of time. I'm sure more to come. That's usually what's been happening is it's uh, actually spontaneously spawned some interesting connections and that that reap fruit. You know. Cool. So good luck with it what flew you're doing. By. I hope you make a lot more money if you want to. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> and also you know stay true to yourself and good luck with uh with everything you're doing so again thank you so much thank you this this went by really fast and is absolute treat so looking forward to talking to you again there you have it folks episode number 51 of the creativity spirituality and making a buck podcast on the be here now network to conclude here, we would like to extend a huge heartfelt thank you to Ramin for joining us and taking the time to be in discussion with David and for all of his amazing work. Thank you, Ramin. We also encourage everyone to head over to BeHereNowNetwork.com. If you enjoy podcasts of this nature discussing spiritual practice in our contemporary world, head over to BeHereNowNetwork.com to check out an ever-growing catalog of podcasts based around mindfulness and Eastern spirituality. Also, give us a like, subscribe, give us all the stars, leave a review, share on the socials, share with your friends. Help us get the word out about the podcast. We would appreciate it. And if you're still listening, well, you made it all the way to the end of the episode and the outro monologue. So again, we really appreciate everyone listening. We hope that you enjoy 
these episodes as much as we enjoy making them and that they are beneficial to you in your life and by extension to all sentient beings. May you be safe, may you be healthy, may you be happy, and may you be at ease. All the best.